And so Christmas can at times be a season of great hustle and bustle and frantic shopping and events and, and staff and uh, work parties and family gatherings and, and the rest and cooking. Hopefully that is the case in your home. But with that, at times comes life without the margins and it can become frantic, as I said. But my prayer is that we would not forget the whole purpose of all of this, and that is Jesus. Jesus desires to enter into your home, to enter into your heart, and bring you much peace. Our world needs peace, doesn't it? Sometimes our own souls, when we sing songs like this, it is well with my soul. Perhaps some of us, if we're honest, don't feel like it's so well in there. Perhaps a little cluttered. Perhaps there are dark spots and uh, spaces in our soul. My prayer today with this message is that you would discover the Prince of Peace, the one who wants to come into your life and into our city and into our world to bring a peace that is beyond understanding. So we need to look up, look up at the purpose of Christmas and remind ourselves that one of the purposes of Christmas is to meet with the Prince of Peace. And so today we go to the text, Luke chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, uh, I encourage you to go there because it's one of those passages that I know will fill your soul. It has filled me and enriched me tremendously as I've meditated on it for uh, quite some time. Luke 2, 22 to 35, it speaks of this man named Simeon. And Simeon is not talked about very often in the Christmas story, but yet he's right there smack in the center of the early beginnings of the life of Jesus and his uh, parents, Mary and Joseph. And so open our hearts. The most important thing you'll hear today is this, the text, the word of the Lord. And so the word of the Lord says, When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord, dedicated to the Lord. And so Mary and Joseph were doing just that with Jesus, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord. And so they came to sacrifice a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem. So as Mary and Joseph were coming into the temple to do what the law had required them to do, there was a man in Jerusalem. His name was Simeon. Simeon was righteous and devout. Wouldn't that be nice if when somebody thinks of our lives and as individuals, they say he is or she is righteous and devout. He was waiting. He was waiting for the Messiah. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for the Savior to come. And the Holy Spirit was on Simeon. It had been revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he actually saw the Lord's Messiah. His eyes would see Jesus before he died. That promise was given to Simeon. And so moved by the Spirit, Simeon went into the temple courts. When the parents, Mary and Joseph, brought Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took Jesus in his arms. Remember this. What a, what a treasured moment. He took Jesus in his arms. Praising God, he said these words, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, just like you told me I would see you, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. In peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father, Mary, uh, the child's father Joseph and, and Mary, his mother, marveled at what was said about Jesus. And then Simeon blessed the parents and said these words to Mary. He said this, this child, oh, this child, this child is destined 
to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword, Mary, a sword, it will pierce your own soul too. The son of yours, yes, has come in a cradle, but one day will be on a cross. And it will be like a sword is thrusting into you, Mary. But boy, will he rise and allow those who believe in him to rise rather than fall. All right, what is this text speaking to us about? And how does it relate to peace? This man, Simeon, I love the fact that Simeon was considered a man who was righteous and devout. My prayer is that you would be one who is righteous and one who is devout. I pray that for my life. I pray that for my boys. I pray that for my loved ones. I pray that we would be righteous and devout. You know why? Because if we're righteous and we're devoted, guess what? We will experience peace in our lives. We will experience peace. Notice the text says about Simeon in verse 25 and in verse, uh, verse, first part of verse 25, it says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. He was righteous and devout. Righteousness is this sense where he had this urgency to want to do life God's way. God, I want want to make sure my life is aligned to your way. I want to do life your way. I, I want to have a heart that is pure before you. Not just my actions, but my reactions and the things I think about, the things that I value. Lord, I want to be righteous because your scripture says, be holy as I am holy. So there's obviously, when we speak of righteousness, it's this this, 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 this stance, this standing that I'm righteous before the Lord. That when there's things in my life that are not right, I, I run to God and say, God, I need your grace. I need your mercy. I need your forgiveness. And we find our righteousness there. But righteousness is not only between myself and the Lord, but it's how I treat others. In fact, if you want a a real barometer reading of your righteousness, if you want a a barometer reading of our own level of righteousness, we need to evaluate how we treat others. You see, if I'm right before God, naturally this, this vertical relationship that I have will have horizontal effects. If I'm truly righteous before God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to love others. I'm going to want to be patient towards others. And kindness will flow out of my life and self-control and, and, and all of those fruit of the Spirit. Why? Because I'm, I'm right with God. That's why Jesus, when asked what are the greatest commandments, said these very important words. He said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So love God with everything you've got. But then he says something, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So if we want to truly be righteous, it it, it obviously starts with standing right with God, but it'll have implications in the way we treat others. No, the reality is I have met And to be honest, at times I can fall into this. I met some crusty Christians where in one sense we're praising God, but then we're short with people. We get angry with people. We speak hateful words towards people. Jesus is saying, if you love me, you're going to love your neighbor as yourself. The two go hand in hand. And so righteousness at its core is, yes, holy before the Lord, but also holy in our interactions with others. Simeon was that kind of guy. He was righteous to, in his heart. He loved God with everything, but he also was righteous in the way he dealt with others. The scriptures also say he was devoted. What does it mean to be devoted? You see, to be devout means to have strong love and loyalty. What mattered to Simeon was that he would do what God had asked him to do with with carefulness, with loyalty. What he said he would do, he would do. He was loyal. He was devoted. He was committed. He didn't let everything else cloud his 
obedience to the work of the Lord. And he did it with a high level of excellence. You see, you might say, what does righteousness and being devoted have anything to do with peace? Well, think about it. If I'm right with God and I'm right with people in the way I treat them, guess what? I'm going to have a peace that comes in my heart. If I am not right with God and I have unconfessed sin in my heart and, and there are dark areas in my heart and there are those sin is a barrier between myself and God, guess what? My peace levels go down. If I've got interactions with others that I know are at odds and there's disunity or, 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 or a brokenness in relationship, guess what? That's going to affect my peace. But if I'm righteous between myself and the Lord and the way I treat others and my relationships, there will be high levels of peace in your life. And if I'm following through with devotedness in the things that God has asked me to do, I'm also going to have a, a high level of peace because I know I'm giving God my best. Simeon was a man of peace because he was righteous and he was devout. 1 Peter 4.11 also says, If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides, so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Further, in Galatians 6.9, it says this, Let us not become weary of doing good, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You see, sometimes being righteous and being devoted in particular, doing the right thing and committed to the right thing and making the right choices over and over again, sometimes we don't always see the results as we like. And it could get a little bit weary. Paul says, don't, don't give up. Don't grow weary of doing good, for at the right time, you will reap a harvest. Don't Simeon is an example to us of a man of righteousness and devotedness. I pray that this season and, and the seasons to come in our life, that we would be seen as people of righteousness and devotedness. Secondly, Simeon was waiting, the text says. Waiting? That's not really exciting, isn't it? Who on earth likes to wait? But it's exactly where Simeon was in his life. It says in verse 25 and verse 26 that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for the coming of the Messiah. Waiting, waiting, day in, day out. We don't know how long the waiting lasted. We don't know Simeon's age. Most scholars believe he was well advanced in years. And so he was waiting. The Spirit had told him, you're going to see Jesus before you die. And every day, every day went on, and every day went on, and he still was waiting to see Jesus. Verse 26, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That was a promise that Simeon had received from the Lord. But he had to wait for it to happen. Waiting. Waiting and waiting. He would have known the words of Isaiah 9, 6 that said, For us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So he was looking every day for the Wonderful Counselor. He was looking every day for the Mighty God. He was looking to see Him because the Spirit told him he would see Him before he died. He was looking for Everlasting Father. He was looking for Prince of Peace. But he had to wait. God has given you promises. God has spoken specific things in your life. But you have to wait. And you've been in seasons of waiting. It feels like it's a long season of waiting. Waiting is a difficult task, isn't it? For most of us, most of the time, who would agree? The rest of you love waiting. You just, I'm just going to just wait it out. Comes naturally to you. Let's be honest. Most of us don't like waiting. You know why I know that? If you're a lot like me, especially around Christmas, 
when you're going into a department store, a grocery store, or a Costco, enter at your own risk. What do you do? You, you look at the lineups and you plan a strategy. Which lineup is going to get me to that cashier the quickest? Okay, Micah, you take that line. Lucas, you take that. Sylvia, you're here, I'm here. Then we'll watch, and whoever gets it, we'll all jump in there. I mean, what, what is that? Because we don't want to wait. When we look at our computer screens, and we're used to high-speed internet, and, and, and the thing's buffering. Three seconds. I, mean, I can't handle this. Click. And we've opened like 20 different windows. Why? Because three-second delay. Because we can't wait. We, I have this new coffee maker. And you can set, I can set the timer on so that before I go to bed, it's already set. Because so that when I get down and put my toes to the pavement in my kitchen, that coffee's already been prepared pretty, all by itself. I didn't even touch a button. So that I just have to walk in and pour it in. Why? Because I don't want to wait around for my coffee. Starbucks. <laughs> you, can, you can actually order your drink on your app so that you just walk in because you're a Gold Star member. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys. Mr. Joel, here's your drink. No lineup for you because you're a Gold Star member. Right? Because you don't have to wait in the lineup like everybody else. Waiting is a difficult task. And I wonder if because we live in a society of the now, that sometimes in the things that matter most, we aren't willing to wait. In fact, here's a thought for us to consider waiting Waiting is a difficult task for most of us most of the time, but I believe that waiting is a key factor when it comes to the things that matter most in life. Waiting is a key factor when it comes to the things that matter most in life. Let's take our marriages, for instance. It takes time for a marriage to become all that God intends it to be. It takes years of developing and nurturing for that marriage and that relationship to get better and better and better. But unfortunately, sometimes we're not willing to give it the time. You see, waiting is a biblical concept over and over again in Scripture. It reminds us to wait. Let's take this verse in, in Psalm 27, 14. It says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. Wait for the Lord. See, the psalmist embeds being strong and take heart because the psalmist is assuming there will be times in our life where we're waiting for the promise, just like Simeon was waiting to see Jesus with his very own eyes. There will be times where you'll get weak. There'll be times where your heart will get discouraged because the waiting seems too long, and the psalmist says, wait. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart and wait for the Lord. Psalm 5.3 says this, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you. And what do I do? I wait expectantly. Every day could be that day where you see that divine moment occur Every day, bring your supplications and requests to the Lord and watch your day unravel in the very will of God in your life, but wait expectantly. Psalm 37, 7 says, be still. Be still. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret. Don't become frantic. Don't become worried. When people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes, what's the psalmist saying? Sometimes you look around, I don't know if you've ever been there, and you see others seem to be on this fast track. It seems like nothing is hindering them, and they're flying down the 401 of life. And it seems like you're just waiting and waiting, and the Lord would want you to know, be still. 
don't fret. Don't go frantic. Wait patiently for him. Psalm 106, 13 speaks about the Israelites, the people of God who were in the wilderness and they were headed to their promised land that God had promised them, but it was taking a long time to get there. Part of it because they were being disobedient to the Lord over and over again, forgetting of all of His faithfulness. So there came a time in their wilderness wanderings where they had soon forgot what God had done and they no longer waited for His plan to unfold. You see, that can happen sometimes in our lives. When we become impatient, what do we do? We end up getting in there and getting it done or pushing things that don't need to be pushed or taking things away that should not be taken away because we want to speed things up. And God says, let me do it in my timing. And instead, we forget to allow his plan to unfold. In fact, in one instance with the people of God, Moses, their leader, was up crying out to God and meeting with God up on the mountain, and they were at the bottom getting impatient. They're like, this guy is too slow. So they decide, let's get another leader. Forget him. Let's build a golden calf. Let's begin to worship it. They went astray because they weren't willing to wait. As a church, I believe in some ways we are in a season of waiting. God has enabled us to to purchase this property, 1100 Canadian Place, and and we are going through this long, I could sing, process with the city, with applications. And so I have these moments where I have these visions of me walking in there and doing some great things. Instead, God says, be still and wait to see what I can do. Wait and see what I can do. And so sometimes in life, when we are tempted to jump in, speed things along, God says, wait. He says, wait. Don't run ahead of me. My way is always the best way. Isaiah 30, verse 8 says, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. Blessed are all who wait for him. Some of you have been waiting for that spouse that you have been praying for. Don't run ahead of God. He's preparing that person at this very moment. At just the right time, he'll intersect your path. For some of us, we're waiting for that financial breakthrough. Be obedient. Trust him all the way through. For others, we're waiting for that relational healing, that broken relationship to be healed again, to be restored. And every part of you wants to get in there. And God says, watch and wait. Be still and know that I am God. Some of you have been given some beautiful dreams. God knows the desires of your heart. Maybe there's couples who desire to have a family and it just hasn't happened yet. God says, wait. I know your heart and I know your desires. For some of us, we're waiting for that family member we're so, uh, that are so dear to us to come to Christ, to come to faith. And it gets frustrating that it doesn't seem like there's progress. And God says, just trust me. Keep doing the right thing. I've got this. Somebody needs to know that. God says, I've got this. I've got this for you. I haven't forgotten you. Be patient. Henry Nouwen, well-known author, says, waiting is a period of learning. The longer we wait, the more we hear about him for whom we are waiting. See, sometimes it's in those seasons of waiting where God does a deep work in our life. Sometimes we want to go from point A to point B. That's our concern. And God says, I'm going to do something more powerful than the B on the journey towards the B. 
Listen for his voice in the times of waiting. Joyce Meyer also says this, which I think she's onto something. Patience is not simply the ability to wait. It's how we behave while we're waiting. What happens in us when we're in seasons of waiting? For the Israelites, they got crusty, they got arrogant, they got impatient. They they started to grumble against each other, especially their leader Moses. In fact, that's why James also says uh, to us when the people were going through difficulty, he says, be like the farmer who plants his seed and then waits for it to bear the harvest over time. He does what he can, but he has to wait now for it to bear fruit. He says, as you wait... James says, don't grumble against each other, for Jesus is standing at the door. You see, sometimes our waiting, there's testing that occurs. What is our behavior in times of waiting? Sometimes it's in our seasons of waiting where we mistreat others because we're not getting our way when we want it. We start to get irritable. We start to become impatient and unkind. And God's saying, you want this waiting period to last longer until you understand what I'm trying to do? Instead, resign yourself. And this is my point. You will experience much peace if you allow yourself to be still in your seasons of waiting. If we're not willing to allow ourselves to be still in our seasons of waiting, we become frantic and the peace levels in our life diminish. Instead, God says, waiting is part of the deal. I'm doing something much deeper in your heart, in your seasons of waiting. Simeon had to wait. We don't know exactly how long he waited, but... My assumption is there was a long duration of seasons of waiting until finally Mary and Joseph on one fine day walked into the temple and Simeon was moved by the Spirit. Read the text. Simeon was moved. Verse 27 and 28 says this. Moved by the Spirit. Literally. From one place to the other, he moved. He went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. Can you imagine that moment? That moment when everything he had been waiting for, that promise that was spoken to him by the Spirit, that your eyes will see Jesus finally came into to, to flourishment. Was it luck that he happened to walk in the temple at just the right time that Mary and Joseph did? No. No, no, no. It was the movement of the Spirit that at just the right time he would intersect the path of Mary and Joseph and most importantly, the Christ. This Christmas, be moved by the Spirit. Amidst all the stuff we've got to get done and the journeys of going from point A to point B, be open to what the Spirit says. Perhaps the Spirit tells you, go down that hallway to that office and speak to that young lady. She needs somebody to speak to today. Perhaps... It's that student, amidst all the studying of exams, you need to stop, and with that student you're studying with, you need to have a spiritual conversation. The things that matter most. Maybe it's in that gathering with family who are having a great time, where the Spirit actually prompts you to speak a word of encouragement to a brother or a sister so that they can meet the Prince of Peace. Perhaps it's inviting that neighbor and actually walking across the street and knocking on the door and saying, hey, next Saturday, do you guys want to come to the movies? You might say, what? I share personal testimony. I felt prompted earlier this week that my, my son plays soccer and 
And, and I have such a heart and burden for those families and those children that I get to interact through my son with. And the Lord says, why don't you invite the entire team and their families to the theater with me? And so I took a risk, and in co- talking to the coach, I said, hey, you know, we're, we're hosting this event, and, and, and uh, you know, we, we want it to be available to the entire team, and all the, the families are welcome to come, and it's completely free. They just have to walk in, and he says, what do you mean? Like, we have to pay something? No, you just come. I don't understand. No, you just have to show up, man. There's no strings attached. I've never heard of a church doing that before. I, he's like, of course I'm going to let all the families know about this event. And so within 24 hours, an email went out to all the families of this soccer team to come to our event. Because grace is free. <laughs> and I'd say, what does that have to do with the Prince of Peace? It starts with understanding that we're broken in need of a Savior who gives us salvation freely. Freely. This Christmas, be moved by the Spirit. Don't get caught up with all the stuff that we forget to introduce people to the Prince of Peace which is the whole purpose of Christmas. Move towards Jesus. Simeon didn't keep Jesus at a distance, did he? What did he do? He held him. I need the Prince of Peace close to my heart. Father, now that I have seen him, my life, it's, I'm, there's, I'm ready to go. Because I've met the master. Everything else and all the other circumstances pale in comparison to having Jesus right here in me. Be moved to Jesus and then be moved to others to introduce them to the same Prince of Peace you've met this Christmas. Simeon was moved by the Spirit. And it was when he was moved by the Spirit where Simeon was at peace with God. Notice what it says, verse 29, 30. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. A light, Jesus says, of revelation, not only to the Gentiles, but to the people of Israel. Jesus has come for all people to be their prince of peace. Simeon was at peace because he had encountered the Prince of Peace. It was as though Simeon was released from a long task that the original language is, is speaking about. It was almost like a slave set free from, 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 from bondage. It was like he was set free from this long waiting task of seeing Jesus. He finally saw him. He finally had him. Uh, uh, held him, and so he was ready to go with God because everything else didn't matter as much as that. Friends, if you've met with Jesus, there should be this deep peace that no matter what the circumstance is like, you're okay because you've got the Prince of Peace in your life. That's the whole point. Introduce him to others. We all want peace. Our world desperately needs peace. But here's some key principles when seeking peace. And the first one is this. Peace does not come from wealth, friends. You know, sometimes I, I hear it often. If only I can make a little bit more money. If only we can have a little bit more, uh, you know, savings. If, if only I could get a better job with a greater rate of pay. Then everything would be peaceful around here, friends. Don't buy into it. Don't buy into that. If you look at the story, Simeon was in many ways a random guy. He had no title. He wasn't some priest. He wasn't, he was just your, he was a random guy. We don't know too much about him. All we know is his name and he was righteous and devoted. He wasn't an affluent man. He didn't have a huge reputation in town. He was just Simeon. And yet God chose Simeon and gave him a promise that he would see with his very own eyes the Messiah. He didn't come 
with all the fanfare. He was just your average guy. Mary and Joseph. In many ways, they were poor. Scripture says that they came. What did they sacrifice? Pigeon or doves? What, there's meaning there. In the Levitical law, they made room for people who were poor Rather than having to give a greater sacrifice, a more costly sacrifice, the scriptures say that they were given the opportunity to give two young pigeons or a pair of doves instead, which were less expensive. And so Mary and Joseph are coming with the less expensive sacrifice because they were poor. And yet here's Simeon, a random guy, with two teenagers who were poor, and yet they were the closest to Jesus. You see, peace and the Prince of Peace does not come because of our wealth. It's because of Him. So no matter what socioeconomic background we are in, our Jesus is for you. Secondly, peace is not dependent on circumstance. In fact, I would say that it's in the dark moments of our lives where we can encounter a deep peace like never before. I have met these folks who, though their circumstance is very perhaps volatile or discouraging or difficult, and yet there they are amidst the storm with complete peace because the Prince of Peace is in their life. Have you ever experienced that? where you've looked around and I've visited amazing people in hospitals and the, their bodies are broken and they're ailing and yet I've seen them sing praises to the Lord as they laid in their hospital bed in complete peace. Why? Because they have Christ in them. It's like Simeon, Lord, your servant, I mean, I, you can take my life today because I have peace with God. So our deep abiding peace that comes from the Prince of Peace is not circumstantial. We can have that deep abiding peace even when the circumstances are difficult. That's why the scriptures say we can have peace beyond understanding. Thirdly, peace for all people comes at a heavy cost. This peace that you and I can have today comes at a heavy cost. Simeon after holding Jesus, looks to his parents and says these words. This child, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword, Mary, will pierce your own soul too. You see, Simeon knew that this baby who came in a cradle, that cradle will now turn into a cross. And he would die. He, in fact, came to die so that we could have peace between us and the Father. It came at a heavy cost, friends. Notice what he says. Jesus will make some fall and some rise. What is he saying? Without Christ, we fall. With Christ, we rise. There's no neutral ground with Christ. You're either with him and you have him in you. If that's the case, you rise. If you reject him or you put him on the sidelines of your lives, you fall this Christmas and for the rest of your life. May you put him at the center of your heart, for he will allow you to rise. Don't put him on the peripherals of your life. Put him in the center of your life. Because without Christ, we fall. He desires to be your Prince of Peace today. As the worship team comes on up, I conclude with this image. As I was preparing this talk today, I, I really felt prompted by the Lord with this image. Those of us who have younger children or who have, uh, can remember when our kids were young where you would use the high chair. The high chair is a beautiful thing. Do you know why? You can put a child in the seat and they have belts on it. And you put the belt on the child. And guess what? You contain the child. 
Amen to that, right? <laughs> Thank you, Father, for those high chairs. So that when the child is there, you're able to feed the child, you're able to nurture the child, but you're also able to leave the child and go do other things, which are sometimes precious moments to get things done. Would you agree? I wonder if at times we have a high chair Christianity. We say we like our baby Jesus and we domesticate him. And we say, "Good, can you sit over there? And we'll come and we'll bless you every once in a while. Make sure you're okay. Notice Simeon, when he held Jesus, he didn't bless Jesus. He blessed the parents because he knew he needed the blessing of the Prince of Peace. Friends, don't contain Jesus in your life. And don't just have him there. He's nice and he's cute. And when I need him, I go. And if I feel like he needs me, I kind of give him a little something. He's the king. He's the prince of peace. He's mighty God. He's wonderful counselor. He's, he's our everything. We're carried by him. Don't push him to the sidelines, almost like a religious thing. He's, he's around, but he's on the peripherals of my life. But hold him close. Simeon held him. I've met the Prince of Peace. Simeon was a man of righteousness, and, de and he was devout. God, may we be righteous and devout. May we be moved by the Spirit to bring peace in very unpeaceful circumstances. And Lord, in those times of waiting, Lord, right now, there are those in this room that are weary and tired. God, you've put promises in their life. And they've been tempted to knee-jerk or get their hands in there to move things along and that they would be still. And this morning, may they encounter the Prince of Peace. Lord, for that couple who needs restoration, I pray that they would allow the Prince of Peace to bring peace in their home again. That you would replace the hatred and the turmoil and the dysfunction with the very presence of God. May we wait patiently for you. Even as a congregation, Lord, we, we won't forget of all your faithfulness to us. We won't run ahead of you. But we'll wait for, for when it's time. And while we wait, we will love we will appreciate, we will be sensitive, we will be kind, we will be gentle, we will be good, we'll be faithful, we'll be devoted, we'll be committed, we will be righteous. For the one who does not have peace with you today, and they've heard that with you they can rise, I pray today that they would make you the prince of peace of their life. And if that's you today, pray uh, an honest prayer that sounds a little bit like this. Jesus, would you come into my heart? Come into my cluttered soul and wash my sin. Forgive me of my sin. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe that you died on a cross for me. The fact that I can have peace today costed you your life. And so I follow you all the days of my life so that I can rise with you when the trumpet sounds. In Jesus' name. Would you stand with us today? Hallelujah, Lord. The Prince of Peace is here today, friend. You've come. Maybe you came with a cluttered heart. Jesus does not want you to leave with a cluttered heart. He wants you to know he's for you. The prince is here. No matter the circumstance, let's worship the prince of peace together.